Thank you so much uh, for this kind introduction and uh, thank you very much for inviting me. It's a great honor and I'm very excited to be here. And um, I would like to start with a very basic problem that has been haunting me for a long time in the clinic. And um, uh, as a clinical geneticist, we, I work a lot with uh, array data. And um, that's why this is the problem that I want to talk about. So usually what you find, if you're very lucky, you find a de novo CNV. And then you think, wow, that's exciting. But now the question is, what are you going to do of the data? How are you going to interpret them? And uh, then if you, let's say, have a deletion, you're first going to look within the deletion if there's a gene that makes sense. Very easy. This is what everyone has been doing. But now the problem is, in particular, I'm interested in skeletal dysplasias and skeletal malformation. And it happened more than I liked than, uh, that I found deletions or duplications which were de novo, so I was very sure they must be disease causing, but I just couldn't make any sense of the genes within. Or sometimes even worse, uh, I found uh, CNVs that didn't have any gene inside. So and this is the problem that I want to talk about. And um, that's why I'll do a little bit of introduction first on uh, what we've done so far. And um, this is mainly done uh, on array data. But now we also moved into genome sequencing. I think for this audience, uh, this would be particularly interesting. And I would like to share some of the, our uh, more recent uh, unpublished results. OK, so um, I, I think many people in the field got very excited when a paper by Joris Feldman and his colleagues came out in Nature um, dealing with whole genome sequencing and how great it is to diagnose rare disease. And in that paper, they were very excited to say that for intellectual disability, they could solve 60%. And I was also very excited about it, but I was more excited about uh, uh, this part over here, the red part. So how come they still couldn't solve 40%? And then I rushed to read the paper, and it turned out that they did whole genome sequencing, but they still just concentrated on the coding part of the genome, which is only 1.5%. And um, so this is kind of a great story, but also a little sad if you think about it. And um, so now what do we know about the uh, non-coding part of the genome? And um, let's start uh, with a very basic. Well, it's only very little. So they used to say in ENCODE, well, it's 2%, and uh, the rest is all just junk. And uh, this is uh, Francis Collins, I just heard, announced now officially you're not allowed to call the rest junk anymore because he kind of got the idea that there must be something in there. But it's very, very hard to understand what's going on there because we don't understand the language. And uh, that's why I want to introduce a little bit um, on what we know about the uh, non-coding uh, non part of the genome, or at least what we think we know. OK, very simple. This is a, the simplest way how you can think about the genome. You have your genes, and uh, they make up only 1.5%. And then you have a lot of nothing. But the idea is that there are enhancer elements, like this one, um, uh, that regulates over large distances uh, a gene. And uh, this would be, for example, uh, seen here in the embryonic mouse, a limp enhancer. And then uh, the idea is that there must be something preventing this from spreading, because next to it might be, for example, a brain enhancer. And now, how does this enhancer know that it should regulate this gene? And this is an interesting fact, um, so an interesting thing. The idea is that there's a, a loop formation. So the DNA comes from very far away. At, for example, at the sonic hedgehog locus, it's over one megabase bound by a tissue-specific transcription factor, and this leads to tissue-specific gene expression. This uh, was known for a while, but, or at least people thought about it, but now there are actually ways to test this. And um, that's why I want to introduce a technique that we use uh, quite frequently called chromosome confirmation capture. So the simple question is, how can you prove this contact? So is it not just some crazy idea? The simplest way would to be able to do fish, but sometimes this uh, doesn't work. And um, that's why we use chromosome confirmation capture. So I told you, you have this loop formation. And then what you need is living cells. So we use patient fibroblasts, or um, quite more frequently, we use mouse embryonic uh, tissue. And then um, we take the tissue, for example, in a mouse embryo at 11.5, where we know there are lots of uh, genes active, let's say, in the limb. But you can do also do it for the brain. And then we fix the tissue by just freezing it or using formaldehyde. And then we cut off, using an restriction enzyme, all the other stuff. So now what we're left with is our gene, our favorite gene, and a potential enhancer that is bound to it by some protein. And um, now I will quickly run through the protocol of uh, 4C or high c um, But uh, we can talk about the details 
I think, afterwards. Okay, so the idea is now we're stuck with the sequence that we know, let's say my favorite gene, and the sequence that I want to know. And um, then we, because we used the same restriction enzyme, we can just ligate them together and then do a PCR if I know what I'm looking for. This is called 3C, but it's very biased, as you can imagine, and a PCR uh, is magic, so sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, that's why it's not so nice. That's why uh, some smart people have thought about other protocols, and um, then the idea is with using other enzymes, you can create a circle and then do a um, PCR, an inverse PCR into the unknown. And then you can look at it on the gel, but this is not so professional at, a, at times of uh, next generation sequencing. Obviously you ligate adapters to it, and then you do next gen sequencing. And then what you get is if you do a 4C, you stand on one viewpoint, let's say your favorite gene, and you get a genome-wide map, as you can see down here. This region will interact with this one, but not with this one, and, but with this one. And, and this will give you a viewpoint of, from your favorite gene all over the genome, which is still biased because you then have to do it for every single gene. That's not so nice. But in 2012, people came up with a protocol called HiC, and this is based on the same technique, but it will give you a genome-wide view. And um, what they did was, um, they discovered the topological associated domains. And because I will talk about that a lot, I want to explain that a little bit. So um, this is what a high c map looks like. And it looks, to me, when I first saw it, I didn't understand anything. That's why I will um, try to explain a little bit. So here is um, a gene that, I'm, uh, really key, that I really like, the efferent locus. And it's surrounded by a very large gene desert. So there are no genes around. And on top, you see uh, the high c map. And um, basically, the red triangle just means that uh, the efferent gene here, and then you go up here, interacts a lot with this region over here, which has an enhancer. This is interesting, but um, I guess what surprised us the most is that there are also regions where there's no interaction. So this enhancer here is very close to this gene, but for some reason, there's something preventing the interaction. And this is what was termed boundary regions, and no one really knew what it was. But when I remember very vividly, and I was talking about it earlier today, um, when this came out in 2012 by, by the Bing Ren Lab, there was a meeting here in London at the Royal Society and this concept of topological associated domains, so this would be one domain, and this is a neighboring domain separated by boundary elements, everyone in the room got really excited. And I, I also thought immediately about our CNVs that we couldn't solve. So obviously, let's think about this deletion down here. If you have a deletion, then you would first look at the gene that's inside. But if you now think about those uh, topological associated domains and the boundary, for example, this deletion here also removes a boundary. So you have to keep that in mind because this might um, disrupt or rewire the interaction within this domain and cause misexpression in the neighboring domain. So we went back to our old data and people have been doing uh, arrays for quite some time in our lab and I mean, everyone does it, I guess. So we thought, okay, if this uh, topological associated domain uh, up here, this would be one domain, this would be another, then you would have a gene here, regulated by an enhancer, let's say in the limb, and in another domain, separated by this boundary, um, and a gene that is expressed only in the vascular system. So what would happen if you have a deletion or a mutation that disrupts this boundary? And at the time we hypothesized and said, well, maybe this causes enhancer adoption. So this evil guy over here, would suddenly hijack the neighboring gene and cause not only expression in the brain, but also in the limb. And um, we called it enhancer adoption, also Laura Letters did, but um, um, other people have called it enhancer hijacking, and soon you can call it enhancer warfare, whatever you want. But the idea is that there's something comes together that um, doesn't belong together, and people would probably have always called it in cytogenetics position effects. And um, this is now all introduction, and what does it have to do with real patients, or how does that relate to actual patients? So when I first saw this, I thought about a family that I had seen uh, a few years ago. So um, this is a very large pedigree uh, in, uh, of a family affected by a rare limb malformation. And if you uh, look at them, they all have abnormalities of the hands and the elbows. And pretty much they walk around like this. They cannot extend their arms further than this, and also their uh, wrists are fixed. And uh, my boss gave it to me on my, actually my first day of work and said, solve the case. And I tried really hard, but I just couldn't find anything. And uh, at the time, we did something really sexy called exome sequencing, but we couldn't find any mutation. And uh, even though we had a linkage interval, 
Um, but so he just said, okay, try harder. And then I um, looked around and I said, how come no one knows what's going on? So I looked like a clinician uh, at the x-rays and I observed something very funny. So this is an x-ray of the patient's arm. And if you think about it, it looks a little abnormal because what's very typical about the elbow is your olecranon. It kind of grabs around the humerus. And in these patient, this, uh, patients, this was completely missing. There's actually a different family, but same phenotype. There was nothing there. And um, in the hands, the bone that is usually very, very tiny, the os pisiforme, was massively enlarged down here, forming a structure that looked almost like the calcaneus of the foot. So I went back to my boss and said, I think those guys have legs where there should be arms. And then he wasn't so excited about it like me, and he said, hmm, maybe you need to look at a few more x-rays before you make a claim like that. And then he also repeated, find the mutation, and then we can talk about it again. So we did then high-resolution array CGH. And um, first we had done, and this was done in the 2000-something, um, and um, we had done an 180K and didn't find anything. So we did high resolution, which with a resolution down to 10 KB, and we found a deletion of a 70 KB removing a gene called H2AFI. So I was very excited again and said, I found my disease gene. The problem was the full knockout of that gene doesn't have any lymph phenotype. They're completely normal, those mice. And that didn't make sense. But what was interesting, that if you look at the topological domain uh, structure of the locus, the deletions removed a TAD boundary. And um, what was even more interesting that on one side was a very strong limp enhancer and on the other side was a well-known gene called PITX1. And PITX1 is the most important gene for hind limb development. So it makes the legs become legs. So uh, we had the hypothesis, okay, maybe, so this is PITX1, it's only expressed in the hind limb and in the jaw but never in the forelimb. So we had the idea that in the wild type this boundary prevents this guy from interacting with PITX. And in our deletion patients, the TAD boundary is gone, and suddenly this guy can hijack or take over PITX and make it expressed also in the forelimb. Sounded like a good hypothesis, but we really didn't have a way to prove it. So at the time, this was before CRISPR came along, I did a very dirty experiment. I basically took this enhancer and cloned it right in front of PITX1 and made a transgenic mouse with it to see if my hypothesis was true. And um, we were lucky, so this is not a great picture, but the mice looked exactly like our patients. They had these arms, uh, which were abnormal, but they also showed misexpression, this is wild type, this is mutant, of PITX1 in the forelimb. And this was uh, nice for us, but it was still pretty anecdotal. Yeah, so I was happy and um, uh, we could publish it, but then people told me, good for you, but does it, is it a more common problem or is it just that one case? And that's why we decided um, we have to find out if this is a more common problem. Uh, so whether enhancer adoption is actually a, a mutational mechanism that needs to be taken serious. And here is just a graph again what it means. So basically by removing this boundary, suddenly this loop can form and this foreign enhancer can also hijack your gene and make it expressed somewhere where it shouldn't belong. And if you think about malformation, even brain malformation, this could be uh, something interesting. So we decided, let's come up with a model, and for this I actually paired up with uh, the head of our bioinformatics department, Peter Nick Robinson, and we said, okay, normally, this is our deletion that I talked about in the beginning, you would always look at gene dosage. This is the most common way. So look at a gene inside, and you don't care about the TADs. But in the rare cases where this doesn't make sense, then you, we need another model. What if, uh, on the one side, you have an, uh, a, an enhancer element, and on the other side of your deletion, you have a disease gene. And if your deletion removes a topological domain boundary, bring in those two together. And um, we decided, okay, how could we ask this question on a more systematic way? We cannot just go through our several cases, but we need a large database. And we were very thankful for the Decipher database because, first of all, you have lots of CNVs in there, of, but you also have phenotypic information. And this was very important because we need to link the phenotype information to the enhancer data that we got from the epigenomic roadmap. So for example, if a brain enhancer element comes close to a brain gene, this would well explain an intellectual disability phenotype. And the same is true for a limb enhancer coming close to a limb gene. And so we um, downloaded 2300 that actually um, 
um, span uh, TAD boundary and ask the question how often is not gene dosage the effect, but how often does uh, enhancer adoption occur? And to our surprise, we found that up to 11% actually made more sense when um, uh, thinking about enhancer adoption. So this was nice, but um, it was still not real proof because it was just data, playing around with data. And um, in particular, uh, all our reviewers, and also when we talked about it, people said, um, we want to know about the sequence. So now you're trying to tell us, well, 11% uh, make enhancer adoption by deleting a TAD boundary. But what about this boundary? And uh, in particular, my boss, as a true human geneticist, he wants a sequence. So he wants to know what makes the boundary. And uh, for this project, we needed um, more cases that we could work on. And we were very lucky that we um, found uh, these guys. And once again, it's a limb phenotype, but you can do this with any kind of other disease. And what you see down here is um, a brachydactyly, a very particular one. It basically just affects the thumb and the index finger. So um, if I, uh, people have told, uh, t uh, told me, well, this is not even a real phenotype. The patients don't have any problem, but it's our hobby, and that's why we investigate them anyway. So we did an array, and um, we found in three different families large deletions, including the Efren gene. So once again, we had our perfect candidate. Three independent families, all deleting the same gene, so it must be a clear cut. So uh, we were also lucky because there was already a full knockout available for the Efren gene. Problem was that they didn't have any problems with the limbs. So that didn't make any sense. And that's why we went back to our idea about the TADs and the boundaries. And what you can see up here is, once again, a high C map of the Efren locus. And um, you can appreciate that the neighboring gene PUX has a tiny TAD. And the genes over here also have a TAD. But our deletions all remove not only the Efren gene, but also this uh, boundary element over here. So we thought this would be a good um, model to study the region. And then what we do is we just look at the locus for a long time. And uh, it sounds very silly, but this is actually what happened. So we, in the original paper by Bing Ren, they said many things associate with boundaries. For example, housekeeping genes, um, retrotransposons, but also CTCF. And um, in that case, we, looked, we just uploaded some uh, CTCF tracks from the common databases, and this is the same thing you just saw before, just in color. So here's the Efren TAD, and here's the neighboring Indian and Pax TAD. And if you look at the um, chip seek from CTCF, then there's a big chunk of peaks here and also a big chunk of peaks here. And the problem is over here, it gets very messy, so that doesn't make so much sense. But we thought, okay, um, this might make sense. Maybe it's really the CTCF. So let's challenge the system. Can we really see if this, those boundaries are respected? And in order to do that, we wanted to do 4C, so chromosome confirmation capture. And this is what the data looked like. So we looked at, um, we looked at our favorite gene, um, Efren in this case, and put a viewpoint there. And every peak here represents an interaction. But then suddenly here at the boundary, the signal stops. And the same is true over here. So here, there's no interaction going by. And the same is true if you put a viewpoint in PUX3. It stops here, and the same is true here. So we had a system where we could know, OK, in the wild type situation, those boundaries are really respected. But uh, now the only thing we needed to find is the evil enhancer cluster. And we were also able to find this guy. So um, here was a cluster of three beautiful limb enhancers. So the idea was, if you remove this boundary, this enhancer can suddenly act on the neighboring gene. The problem is how you're going to prove it. And um, this can be very tough. And uh, now I want to talk about a very painful uh, subject of my own career. So, I am, so this was our hypothesis. We said this must be enhancer adoption. And those enhancers misregulate the neighboring genes. But the only way to prove it is to make a mouse model. And to make large deletions in a mouse model can take a very long time. And I did a conventional knockout, and it took me one year, and then in the end, the mouse didn't have a phenotype, so we couldn't do anything with it. This was so annoying, but at the same time, suddenly this paper and many other papers came out in Cell um, talking about a system called CRISPR-Cas that now everyone talks about. But at the time, in 2013, I actually had to Google it to find out what it means. Uh, and what they were saying, and uh, Rudi Jenisch and Feng Chang were involved in this, that they made a knockout mouse in three weeks. 
And I remember talking to my boss about it, and he said, this must be a lie. I mean, this cannot be true. It would be a punch in the face for anyone trying to make a normal knockout. The problem is, it is actually true. And um, so how it works is, I probably, you're all familiar with it. I just give a brief introduction on it. So CRISPR-Cas was originally identified in bacteria as a defense against fakes. And they have the evil habit to introduce their own DNA. So those bacteria defend themselves by just cutting it out. And what you see up here is that uh, Jennifer Dudna and Emmanuel Charpentier modified the system so that you can use a DNA um, and tell it where this CRISPR-Cas system should cut. And it will create a double strand break, either cutting out what you want, or you can even uh, give it a template and then introducing whatever you want. And this is very efficient in human cells, but any other cell as well. And um, it's so easy that really anyone can use it. And so we tried, okay, can we maybe use it to use structural variations? And I really remember our first experiment, we had the cell paper in one hand and the pipette in the other, and we didn't really know what we were doing, but we, it's such a so robust system that it immediately worked. And uh, the, we had the crazy idea, let's just not do this by injecting it into oocytes, but do it in cells and not take one CRISPR, but two. And this would maybe give us the possibility to make very large deletions. So what we do is we just transfect it with a selection marker and then pick colonies and then genotype them and look for our favorite uh, colony. And this is nice because you don't waste any animals. And in the end, if you pick a few hundred uh, uh, clones, you can create um, deletions up to two megabases and at the same time also inversions and sometimes this really surprised me, even duplications. And the efficiencies, at least in our hands, um, sometimes go up to 30%. Sometimes if it's very large, it goes down. And the beautiful thing is also you can create homozygous animals right away because sometimes you get a homozygous ES cell. So with this system, we thought, let's tackle the problem of tad boundaries. And this is what we did. So let's go back to our patient. Um, here is once again the, the TAD. And um, the neighboring gene PUX3 is never expressed in the limb, at least not in the distal limb. And um, you can also see here the expression, uh, the, connect, uh, the interaction doesn't spread, so it respects the boundary. So if this is the case, you get a beautiful limb in mouse and in humans. So, but what about our one megabase deletion of the patient? Now, we created it in the mouse, and we delete the boundary and the gene, and suddenly we can see that the 4C signal spreads over here, and there's interaction with the enhancers. And also in the in situ, you see suddenly the gene, PUX3, is expressed in the limb where it shouldn't be, so true enhancer adoption. And we were also lucky because the fingers were also short, exactly like in the patients. So uh, by doing this, we were very excited, but then we had a large discussion in the lab, and I must admit I was very wrong. So people said, well, it's just a position effect. If you remove one megabase, obviously some things will come together. But what does it have to do with the boundary? So we did a control experiment. I told you that this boundary was associated with CTCF binding. So we made a control experiment with just a tiny smaller deletion, leaving the CTCF site intact. And this is what happened. So it's almost the same size, but leaving the CTCF there. So no interaction anymore over here. And suddenly, also the misexpression is gone, and the hands look completely normal. By this, we were able to prove that these non-coding boundaries do actually exist, and that they need to be kept in mind if you think about your CNV. So this was very nice, and we were excited about it. And um, I just would like to summarize this part of the talk. So basically, the idea is now, you have this large TAD, and um, it is one regulatory domain. And this enhancer will interact with its favorite gene. Everything is fine. Now, if you have a deletion that removes this boundary over here, then the looping will suddenly spread and interact with the neighboring gene. But if you make a control deletion, leaving the CTCF and the cohesin sites intact, nothing will happen at all. So those, um, now for us clinically, that means I use those TAD boundaries in order to interpret our CNVs on a regular basis. I just have them uh, as a running track in my analysis tool and check, well, if the genes don't make sense, maybe it affects a boundary. Okay, um, this was once again one case, and that's why we decided this is not enough. We need uh, more cases in order to prove if this is just a single experience or does it more happen, happen more frequently. 
And um, so what's the frequency of these events? And uh, maybe this is very specific to my favorite uh, or our cohort. So we are dealing with limb malformation. And you can see here, they, look, they all affect the limb, but they all look very, very different. But no large-scale studies have been done so far. So we decided to do a very old-fashioned experiment and just analyze many of them by RACGH. And we've done uh, 350 cases and um, just looked for CNVs. And um, what you get in the end is very comparable to our clinical intellectual disability CNVs. In around 12%, you can solve the case by looking at CNVs. Not so exciting because it's similar to ID. But what was, um, uh, so if I mean solving, then that means there are known disease loci. We were a little lucky because we found four new loci. But now we wanted to ask the question, how many actually affect coding CNVs? So in which uh, cases do we delete a known disease gene? And how many cases affect, uh, result in a position effect? So by enhancer adoption or by deleting an enhancer. And I want to share some examples that we worked up um, um, with you. And the simplest thing is obviously, as I said, well, gene dosage, right? This was a case with a severe polyductyly and we found a large deletion within GLEE3. GLEE3 is the uh, nonsense mutations in the gene cause exactly that phenotype. Case solved, very simple. So we would put that to the gene dosage box. But now what about the de novo variants that we couldn't solve? And I will, just, I will not show all of them, just two that uh, made uh, nice mouse models. And so I told you we found four new loci. That's why I will share them with you. Um, so one large family and then a few de novo cases all affected with different disease. And because they, those cases are so rare, we just decided let's make mice for all of them. No, because we will not find a second family. And um, because now within 10 weeks we can make a transgenic mouse, it's actually feasible in a clinical setting, I know not quite clinical, but semi-clinical setting, to, uh, to investigate those CNVs. So we made mice using CRISPR for all of them. And um, uh, this is one case that we could solve. So what if a deletion removes an enhancer element? This, and you can th say the same thing for a point mutation. It's just the problem that there's so much more of them that it's harder to find them. But um, what would happen in theory, you delete the enhancer element, this loop cannot take for, uh, place anymore, and you get a loss of function. We call it a regular loss of function. And um, this is what we found in this family, very large family, affected with a brachydactyly type E. And uh, brachydactyly means shortening of fingers. And in this particular case, you can see that it's only the metacarpals. So basically, the hand plate looks very short. And usually, clinically, you see that the knuckles are absent. And we found a de novo deletion of nothing. So it was very confusing. It, um, it's in the middle of nowhere. It deletes a gene desert. Sounds annoying, but it's de novo. So I think I, uh, I thought I'd take a look. And if you know a little bit of, about limb malformation, this was the ideal candidate because right next to it is the Hox D cluster. And Hox D cluster plays an essential role for limb development. And I already knew that a friend of mine had um, published a cool paper on that locus. And it wasn't actually true. So this wasn't a deletion of nothing, but it was a deletion of four already cloned in limb enhancer elements. And so we decided, well, if this is the perfect case, let's make a mouse and see what happens. And this must, in the end, affect the HOXD um, expression because it's located in the same TAD. And this is what we did. So here we see the wild type situation. You have beautiful hands with beautiful metacarpals in mouse, uh, in mouse here and men. And in our deletion, we create, uh, delete this whole region. And suddenly, you get shortening of metacarpals. And the same is true in the mouse. So a very simple idea, I think, loss of function. Enhancer gone, makes sense. Um, and then another case, so this case was solved. Um, and then another case is of enhancer adoption that I will just briefly show. And uh, I actually noted it down here to know, so that I don't forget it. Um, recently, enhancer adoption is not uh, only being recognized in developmental disorders, but it appears to be a key thing in cancer. So there have been numerous papers um, in particular from American groups, saying that uh, uh, removing topological domain boundaries, bringing things together that shouldn't be together, results in misexpression, which is a key feature of cancer. Okay, so, um, but we found it in this case, it's, um, this patient has a polyductyly and a, a fusion of radius and ulna, 
and we found a de novo deletion of several genes. Sounds great again. Problem is that all those genes carry multiple uh, frame shift or nonsense variants in exact. And also mouse models didn't show anything. So I went into the high C data and once again found a tad boundary located here. And what was even more beautiful, we found an enhancer cluster on the other side that had already been cloned. So we decided, well, this must be enhancer adoption and we made the mouse. So usually this gene over here, it's a transcription factor, is not expressed in the limb at all. But in our mice where we delete this, this gene comes close and is severely now misregulated in the limb. Unfortunately, it didn't show a limb phenotype and this happens more frequently than we would like. So we had to do another experiment in order to prove, or at least try to prove that this is really true. So we decided, well, let's make the deletion just tiny bit larger and remove also the enhancers itself. And uh, by deleting them too, we, the misexpression was gone. So proving that those enhancers are really the driver of misexpression. Okay, so uh, I showed you some examples, but now I told you I want to talk about frequency. And um, this is the last thing that I will talk about before going to the genomes. So how many of our uh, variants are now due to gene dosage and how many in our cohort are due to cis-regulatory effects? And at least I was pretty surprised that in our uh, 350 cases, I told you we can solve 12%, but of the 12%, the majority, 56%, were actually due to position effects, and uh, uh, only 44% were due to removing a diseased gene. And if you think about it, um, also from a clinical perspective, in many of the uh, known microdeletion or microduplication syndromes, the disease gene is not known. People just say, well, if you have 10 cases, it must be disease causing, but who cares what's the disease mechanism? And I would say, if we would look more carefully, it probably uh, would um, show some similar result that the genes next to it um, will also be affected. And in our cohort, um, we found, uh, we solved, uh, so those 56% correspond to 21 cases, and uh, four were due to deletions of enhancers, 13 due to bringing things together, so enhancer adoption, and um, four were actually due to duplication of enhancers, so this can also cause misexpression. This is all, um, this is why I would like to uh, switch gears a little bit and go now to genomes. So basically what I told you now is that I think, and I think we, I hope I could make a point, if you have a deletion or a structural variation, don't just look inside, but try to make sense of the things that are left and right. This can sometimes help. And um, now obviously, and this is in particular, uh, I think exciting about um, uh, the newest technology, such as whole genome sequencing. Now we can actually uh, start looking at the genome as the whole and not just focus on the exome. And um, we try to use this in different studies to identify smaller single nucleotide or smaller CMVs or single nucleotide variants in the non-coding region. And I can tell you before I actually start that it's tough. And I thought, I don't know, maybe I'm naive, but we always thought that if we sequence the whole genome, then the mutations would just pop out. But uh, it's very, very complicated because there are just so many of them. So um, one project that I'm doing together with the uh, uh, colleagues from Nyming, Joris Feldman's group, is that we took 25 cases of a syndrome called split hand foot malformation. And this is a tricky one because as you can see here, so basically the, the middle fingers are missing. But for example, in this individual, you can also see that uh, the penetrance is even, or the vir variability is very high. So even within one individual, you can have just one hand affected or uh, the mother might just have slight syndactyly and then the child has severe shortening and split, hand, uh, split hands and feet. So it's very difficult to grasp, but what's nice about it, that most of the cases are unsolved. So we did exomes and we did high resolution array on this cohort and still almost 70% are unsolved. So we decided let's do genome sequencing and solve all those cases. But now the question is how can you prioritize your variants? Because we all know if you, let's take the simplest thing, we work mainly with a non-consanguinous cohort. So we're thinking about de novo and particularly the guys from Holland have, a great, have great experience with de novo variants. So it should be really easy to find them. But if you have 100 de novo case, uh, variants, uh, single nucleotide variants in every generation, 
which one is it going to be? And I can only talk about what we do for LIMP. I cannot solve uh, the whole case, but uh, I think for LIMP, we have a good strategy because there's a beautiful data set available that was generated by a guy called uh, um, Kotney. And what he did is, I think, a strange experiment, but it's useful for us. He performed chip seek uh, using an enhancer mark, H3K27 acetylation, which is currently the best enhancer mark, in mice in monkeys, and up here, also in human limbs. So he actually took human embryos, the tissue that I'm interested in, and he used uh, four different tissues, at uh, four different time points, and then generated genome-wide maps. And he then compared them, but I'm just interested in the enhancer marks. And the good thing is that about 70% of those peaks, and we did the peak calling again, but it's still true, 70% of the peaks that we call are actually in vivo enhancers, if you make a transgenic mouse. So if you think about it, if you find a mutation in an enhancer like this, this would be your ideal candidate. But then um, you have to think about all the rest of the information. And um, now I'm going to show a very confusing slide because this is far from uh, being finished. But basically what I do, and this is what we do in the lab, is if we have variants, single nucleotide variants, then we try to combine all the data that are available and also the data that I talked to you about today. For example, very important, and those enhancers that we got from humans, but, uh, and uh, the known enhancers, but also the chip seek peaks, but then where are you going to find the disease gene? So then you need the topological associated domains because your disease gene will be then within this uh, megabase window. And it's not always the next neighboring gene, but it can be up to one megabase away. And then you need also conservation, and this is a key point in our uh, thing. We believe that limb malformations if you have uh, should or enhancers should be conserved because it's a very fundamental thing, but we might be wrong, so it's pretty biased. So because I do this all by hand, it takes really a long time and I cannot do it for 100. So what we do is basically we write very simple scripts just to compute uh, all this data together and then just feed um, the computer our single nucleotide variants. And by doing this, we were able to create a regulome, so a region of the a whole, of the, we could, a nucleot, uh, nu on a nucleotide resolution, give a score to the whole genome. And um, I don't want to bore you with the details of our score, but basically, it works like this. You get a zero if it's coding, because you always go for the coding first. Makes sense. But then, if there's a known limb enhancer, you get a one, or if there's a conserved and uh, functionally relevant, so one of those peaks, you get a two. And those two are our regulomes. So those are the best of the best. So basically, it's highly conserved. There is a known enhancer, or there's a known peak. And right next to it should be a known disease gene. And by doing that, we boil it down to 0.4% of the genome. And uh, now we apply this filter on our, um, our cohort. And um, I will show you just some preliminary data, but um, um, I think it's pretty nice. So I told you that in each generation you have 100 de novo variants, so in 25 trios we had a lot more. And with using our score, we could boil it down to just seven de novos that we think are very, very good candidates. And uh, this is done in 25 uh, trios. And I will just share one with you that uh, we've done some functional work up on. So um, this is, uh, doesn't look very polished, but there is a single nucleotide change in this position. So it's highly conserved and it has a beautiful peak. And what's even better, it's located in a gene that is highly expressed in the limb. So what we did now is we cloned this region and uh, tried to find out if it's an indeed an enhancer. And we were lucky. It shows a very specific expression pattern in the digits. So it's an ideal candidate. Now the next thing is that we have to do is we have to clone the exact mutation and see if this disturbs this um, uh, enhancer function. But um, uh, this is in the process. But what's nice is that the gene um, where the um, enhancer belongs to is a well-known disease gene oh, sorry, um, um, that has been shown to cause lymph phenotypes that are very, very similar to what we are observing in our patients. So this would be one strategy. So looking for single nucleotide variants, and I, um, I don't think I'm telling you too much, but I think those are going to be the hardest uh, because just there are so many. But um, at least one has to try somewhere. And our strategy at the moment is epigenetics data. Um, we can discuss many other ways. Then another strategy is to look for small CNVs. And that's the beauty of uh, whole genome sequencing. You, don't, uh, you not only get the 
uh, exome, but you get the CNVs at the same time if, you're, if you find a good caller. And so we have another project where we now use Illumina data. And um, this is just historically that we have two different uh, uh, partners that we do it with. So um, we used 36 trios and um, looked for small CNVs. And why do we look for small CNVs? Simply because we've done arrays for all of them, so we're not going to find any large ones anymore. And we proved this. This was nice. So, um, and then I was very surprised that in 36 trios, we only found six de novo deletions. So I expected the number to be higher because I just hoped that I could solve all my cases with this. But um, the sad truth is that people have now published also uh, uh, de novo deletions on healthy individuals. And this is about the number you can expect. So it's, very, it's a very rare event. And um, this is one case that I want to share with you that I think is pretty cool. So this is a case that we've done every, we had done everything on him. And he has a bilateral um, shortening uh, of the hands and oligodactyly. So you see he only had three digits. And what did we find? We found a tiny, and by saying tiny, I mean um, a 2KB deletion in the middle of nowhere. Really, there's nothing here. But it was de novo, we could confirm that. And um, the neighboring gene within the topological domain is HAN2. And HAN2 is the ideal candidate because it's one of the key regulators of limb development. So we decided, OK, let's look at it in the mouse. And uh, this is a wild type skeleton of the mouse with the beautiful five fingers and the radius and ulna. And this is our patient with only two uh, digits. And this is what the mutant mouse looks, looks like. If you just remove that tiny bit, suddenly the mice show exactly the same phenotype. So I'm pretty sure that this is disease causing. And it removes the enhancer element that tells the gene to be on in the limb. So it corresponds to the uh, knockout. Um, we have a few more going on like this, but I, I hope the, the concept is clear. So in our hands, uh, we try to find the, um, uh, the small stuff and then investigate them in the mice. But um, we also look for homozygous ones. And um, this is a little bit cheating because this one we also found by an array, but um, uh, it's a very cool case. That's why I wanted to share it with you. This is a very small uh, homozygous CNV. And small, I mean it's 12 KB, once again in the middle of nowhere. And uh, it regulates the neighboring gene. No one really believed it until we made a mouse because this is what the mice looked like. So they had severe malformation of the digits, proving again that those small CNVs are in fact disease causing. And with all other technologies, we would miss them. That's why I personally think whole genome sequencing would be the way to go. But um, it's a lot of data. And, um, and now, last but not least, um, I want to talk about a touchy topic, and this is particular to limb malformation. What about rare inherited variants? This is really difficult because there are so many. But in, in limb malformation, low penetrance is a key feature. So we decided also to look at some of them. And um, uh, he's actually wrong. So rare inherited variants. And in 36 trios, you find a lot. So on average, in every trio, uh, you find 30 rare, very rare inherited variants. But we were lucky to find this guy. So this is a, a, a patient that came in as a de novo case because the mother is completely normal. And we found an ultra rare CNV of 12 KB that affected uh, the, the daughter. But um, when I went back to the mo mother, she said, well, actually, my, my brother also has a little bit of syndactyly of the feet. And when we did the testing, we found the CNV not only in her, but also in the mother and in the affected uncle. So um, we think of it as low penetrance. And I think there are going to be more than we think, at least in our cohort. And this is what it looks like. So it's a deletion that actually removes four exons of a gene that doesn't have anything to do with limb malformation because we, uh, it has been knocked out. But the neighboring gene is a, the perfect candidate called FGF8. It makes digit number. And um, then we decided to make a mouse model again. And this is what it looked like. So a little disturbing, at least to me, so, uh, our patient had too few digits. Now the mouse, one, two, three, four, five, six, had suddenly too many. So it has something to do with FGF8 because we can show that the neighboring gene is misregulated, but it's hard for me to understand at the moment why the mice show the opposite phenotype. And this is also what I would like to close with. I, am, I hope I could convince you that I'm very, very excited about uh, CRISPR-Cas and about the mouse as a model system. 
And I think we are so fast that we can now investigate many cases that we would have never, uh, otherwise never dared to investigate. But um, even though they are 98% the same, there are still differences. And mice are very robust. And I could show you a whole battery of cases where we don't have any phenotype. So that's a little disappointing for us at least. OK, with this, um, I would like to conclude my talk. And uh, I hope I could convince you that the genome is divided in topological associated domains and that these are important for us as clinical geneticists. And then I tried to talk about the fact that CRISPR-Cas is a very powerful tool to investigate uh, CNVs, but also mutations in vivo. And it can be very fast. And uh, another thing is that I would, uh, I hope I could uh, get your attention on also the non-coding part, because we could show in several cases that even tiny mutations or deletions in the middle of nowhere or duplications are responsible for congenital disease. And last but not least, I think you know that better than me, I think whole genome sequencing is an awesome and powerful tool to investigate rare disease. And I hope in the future everyone will do it. And uh, with this, to just not to be so excited about CRISPR, remember people are also very concerned about it, but uh, everyone has to decide that on their own. Uh, and that's why I would like to thank everyone uh, involved in all these projects, in particular my boss, Stefan Mundlos, and uh, my student, Piersch, and, uh, and, and some other students. It was really, many people are involved in this, and obviously the funding organizations. But I would really like to thank you for your attention, and I would be very excited to hear what you think about my ideas. <laughs>